Right. Uh, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to another WISH webinar. It's our first of 2022. Um, you may say that it's already May, and we have uh, let half the year slip by without having any webinars, and for that I do apologize. Uh, we do plan to have um, a few more webinars as the year continues. Um, you'll remember that the, the inaugural WISH Congress uh, was held in March this year, so uh, we focused on that and now we're restarting our webinars, hopefully once a month. Um, and it was in fact at that Congress that we started to think about this webinar tonight. Um, it was raised in one of the sessions about uh, therapeutic use exemptions. And so um, Dr. Pillay um, and, and the rest of um, the people from the SA Institute for Drug-Free Sport thought it was a good idea to try and hold an evening where we can educate um, anyone who uh, cares or is an athlete, them, uh, cares for or is an athlete themselves. And hopefully by the end of this evening, we'll all be a little bit more familiar with the therapeutic use exemption process. We'll know exactly who, when, why, and how it is required. Uh, before I hand over to Lee, who will introduce the panel, um, I would just like to thank our sponsors who have stuck with us um, and they are gratefully uh, we are very grateful to them for their educational grant that they give us. So that's Asino Lito Pharmaceuticals. Thank you very much. Um, also, thank you to SASMA, who does also advertise um, these webinars and is on board. Um, unfortunately, this evening, I, I see there was a double booking. There is another webinar in, in which SASMA is involved. So, so that is unfortunate that uh, we, we just couldn't um, plan that a little bit better. Um, do apologize for that as well. Um, on that note, um, I think we are in for a very good evening. Um, we've got a, a good panel of speakers and I will hand over to Dr. Lee Pillay to introduce all those speakers. Over to you, Lee. Good evening, everybody. I uh, hope everyone's uh, surviving these low chilling times uh, and happy that you could join us. Just like to say thank you to Wish uh, and thank you to SESMA for continuously allowing us to educate people within the sphere of sports medicine. And uh, today, yes, we, we, we hoping to, to get everyone to understand a very important aspect of uh, sports medicine. And that is uh, the TUEs. Now, I'm just, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to share the screen here. Uh, ah, there's it. So South Africa's National Anti-Doping Agency is called Drug Free, uh, South African Institute for Drug-Free Sport. And uh, they are the ones that run the entire anti-doping process in South Africa, et cetera. Um, so today, what, what we would like to do is we would like to introduce how the TUE process works. And there's a couple of reasons why we say we need to introduce it and explain it to people. Okay. So firstly, many, many, many physicians, they still actually don't understand the process, even though they've been submitting uh, documentation for many years. Some people think that the process involves no medical people. They think it's just an administrative thing that happens. And uh, once they fill in the form, then the TUE is already approved. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge process that goes behind the scenes uh, for everything to get approved. So what we always want to do is also, we want people to provide us with enough information. And most of the time people provide us with minimal information, which then delays the entire process. And just to remind people, some people don't even know what TUE stands for. It means therapeutic use of exemption. So basically we, you are trying to get the athlete to use a substance that is on the water ban list because of a medical condition. And uh, that's important to, to recognize and remember that. We always get uh, some comments from doctors, etc., saying that they're not gonna share the information with us. Please be aware, we've all signed confidentiality agreements. Uh, we all signed Poppy Act agreements. And also the new TUE forms uh, allow the entire process to take place from a legal perspective. So what do we hope that you learn in these sessions that we're gonna give uh, this evening? So number one, how athletes are categorized. 
So that's whether they national, international, etc. And then which athletes require TUE to be in place prior to competitions and which athletes are allowed retroactive applications. Then to understand the communication process that happens between the athlete and the therapeutic user exemption committee. And very importantly, we're going to also discuss what information we require on applying for a TUE in different circumstances. This, this becomes vital because that information is, is, is necessary for us to make a decision. Another important aspect that we're going to bring up is the changes in the WADA prohibited list, which happens on a yearly basis. And this year, there are quite a few important um, changes that has happened. Uh, lots of people are not aware of these changes. Um, so uh, I think it's important to pay attention to that. So Dr. Craig Thompson, who is uh, one of the TUE committee members, is going to present to us next um, about athletes, who, when, how, where, what, however. Craig, uh, if I can hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. And thanks for inviting me to be part of this panel session this evening. Um, let me just see if I can share a screen on where I need to be and where we're taking the panel. So can everybody see the, see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Let's just see. And so I want to talk about the South obviously the South African athlete who in South Africa needs a TUE and, and when do they need a TUE? The first thing I want to ad advise as, as Leah said that um, so many doctors don't know where to find out what, um, what and where they should help their athletes when, when, when prescribing any medication really. And really a very simple, a very simple app or a very simple uh, um, screen I have on my desk every day is the drug free sport screen and it's opened on drugfreesport.org.za and very simply I choose online medication check. So it's, it's all the medication that's registered in the South African uh, context and used by uh, and approved by SARPA and all the pharmacy council medications. So all you need to really do is type in the name of a, a medication and I've chosen something called Carvitrin used in, in many conditions in South Africa. And that will then flag for you immediately is the, the medication permitted, prohibited at all times, prohibited in competition and then prohibited in certain sports. And, and so you'll get the answer pretty soon. And when we type in COVID trend, we generally will get the purple block highlighting in, term, in terms of prohibited in certain sports. We know that beta blockers are, 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 are prohibited, especially in sports of, called in archery and in shooting, um, in golf as well. And um, remember that if you look at this further, um, uh, if you look further into the into the explanation, it will say that beta blockers in archery and shooting is, is prohibited in and out of competition. Whereas if you look at other uh, automobile sports, billiards, darts, and golf, it's only prohibited in competition. So this is very important for you to know that, well, not necessarily that detail, but you can find it on this on this particular particular um, page. So the next is the slide, there we go. So then you're going to tick on the, if I just go back quickly, you're going to tick on a slide, uh, you're gonna tick on a link that says, okay, so this is prohibited. I know I need to apply then for a TUE for this athlete, but now who needs to apply? Then if you click on that link, it brings you to this page. So this page, you could even get this page. It's next, it's next to the link on medication check on the website in terms of TUE. And the next question you need to ask yourself is, so we, we know you need a TUE, but what level of athlete am I? Or if you're the physician, what level of athlete is sitting in front of you in your rooms? And then also quite, uh, quite handy is that you have 
uh, um, documents that can guide you through who needs to apply and when. So very similar to what I'm going to go through now, you can really get to all of that. So in essence, in South Africa, who really needs to apply for a TUE? So if you're a national athlete, and I'm going to get to that de those definitions soon, if you're an international athlete or if you're an other athlete. And so you just also need to understand in terms of, of when um, we've spoken about and Lee's touched on some of these things already in his introduction. When, so in advance means before you take part in any event, your, your TUE needs to be submitted and often approved before, before your participation. Retroactive is a little bit different. There's, there's going to be a lot of talk later on about retroactive um, applications but that you say it in essence is after or even during the event so some athletes get tested positive during the event and and they don't necessarily need to have the tu in in place beforehand um, because not all athletes get tested or obviously in the case of a medical emergency where some medication was given to you as in order to treat whatever medical condition uh, um, a retroactive status would apply. So national or international athletes need to apply for a TUE before they participate or before they take any medication which you have identified on your medication check is prohibited in the sport. If athletes are on medication for a long time, often chronic medication, for example, the beta blocker, say for in a, a example, a hypertensive patient, if they are elevated to a level of, uh, of national participation, um, they need to check their medication immediately, as this may mean that they then need to apply for that TUE um, as a prohibited medication immediately and or a prohibited method for, for that matter. So then in terms of national athletes, and this will be most of our athletes would be national athletes, um, Drug-free sport determines the criteria for when is an athlete a national level athlete in accordance with the WADA rules. So an, a national athlete would be athletes who hold professional South African license to compete. Athletes which in the, in the, in the South African drug-free sport, what we call the registered testing pool or RTP, um, that the athlete would know because they'd have to register with SAIDs and vice versa and also register with their national federation. Athletes who participate in any national competition or events in South Africa or in selection events for national or they selected for events for national competitions. Athletes that then <clears throat> there's a bit of a distinction between athletes who, who, who represent South Africa internationally, but they may not necessarily be in the international registered testing pool. So this sounds a little bit contradictory and it sounds a bit confusing but in essence all of this can be checked either with drug free sport or it can be checked with the or the athlete can check it with their own national federation um, in terms of what their status would be at any particular time um, so remember though that if any athlete is classified by the respective international federation as international, they should be considered international. So international is your highest, um, your highest default level and, and not national level athletes. So in terms of point C, um, athletes that participate in national competitions, um, they and or events, they are or selected for their national teams, they need to apply for the TUE in advance, as mentioned before, similar to international athletes. And this TUE must be in place at least seven days prior to the event. And it should last at least for the duration of the event. Um, for those who, who, who want to take a prohibited medication or need to for, for a particular reason. Um, so just not here, but where you will find, and to give you an example of national athlete uh, conditions in particular codes. So rugby is a, a well-loved sport in South Africa, and, and that this that I'm mentioning now is easy to find on the Drug Free Sport website. So rugby would consider national athletes to be all players who compete in the senior Curry Cup competition 
and or pro rugby competition, which at the moment is the URC. And as the, the, the different parts of the year goes on, these competitions change. And from a, a, a national and international side, all um, rugby players in the national under 20 team and the senior male and female national teams would all be considered national players. And this includes 15s and 7s um, um, versions of the sport. Inter, um, I've used a, 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 an example of, of a beta blocker. And if I look at shooting um, on a national level, athletes who compete in shooting disciplines for selection to the Commonwealth Games and Olympic Games, they would be considered national athletes. And the same, uh, uh, the same level of athlete would be also be uh, considered to be international athletes when they go and participate in the particular games. And uh, as some of us may know, in August, the Commonwealth Games are, are, are due to arrive um, in Birmingham and our athletes, some of our athletes will compete in that. So if you're selected in a national team, you need to obviously uh, apply for your TUE as soon as you're selected, if there is not one in place already. If an athlete loses a place in a team, they would still qualify as a national level athlete for the period, at least for the calendar year, in which part of the in which they are part of the team and the TUE must still be in place as they could still be tested during this time. Then in terms of international athletes, an international athlete is, is determined by the International Federation. So South African Rugby Union would be, would be uh, behove to world rugby. Um, one of the potential criteria, of course, is, is, is the athlete to be part of the, the uh, registered testing pool on the international side. Um, and of course, participation at the international uh, level events, like I've just mentioned in rugby now, uh, they would all be uh, classified then as international athletes. And, and just the distinction being that, that these athletes need to have their TUEs in advance. So the, again, just one or two little things to know, but this is again all on the Drug Free Sport website, is that if you're competing in a, at an international uh, event, and you already have a, a TUE granted by South African Drug Free Sport. You have to check with the International Federation whether the South African TUE will be recognized automatically internationally. And if not, you may need to reply, you may need to apply through the International Federation for its for the for the recognition of your use of a prohibited medication. If you don't have a TUE granted by SAIDS, again, you have to check with your feder with the International Federation whether they consider you as an international athlete for the purposes of that particular event. So it all sounds pretty technical and all sounds pretty, you know, sometimes even confusing. And sometimes uh, us as, as TUE commissioners also will have to check with, uh, with if not drug-free sport, through Sakumzi, who's coming up next, we have to check with the federations um, locally and or internationally as well. So in terms of the other athletes, which is probably many more athletes you're going to see in your practice compared to national and international athletes. These are all other athletes, including rec recreational athletes who qualify. They would qualify for a retroactive TUE. And so the... the um, the definition is that they only need to apply for a TUE if they are tested and used and, and they are using a prohibited medication. And yeah, I can uh, having uh, working currently at, at um, Stellenbosch University um, and we just played varsity cup. So for example, some of the athletes use Ritalin or methylphenidate uh, that we know to be a prohibited medication. And so what our athletes would do well, what we would suggest they do is they have all their documentation in place so that if they are tested after a match and they, they then test positive for this prohibited medication, that we can do a retroactive TUE for them. Um, so this then allows the athlete the opportunity at least to apply if they are tested. And uh, um, like, like Lee will mention later, the commission will will review all of these and make sure that we satisfied that the criteria they put in place 
um, meets the international standard. So we always recommend that the athletes, these athletes gather the relevant medical information in advance because it's not always easy to get reports for, for things like Ritalin. Again, on the website, you have guidelines which, which guide every doctor who's filling out a TUE in terms of what information is required in order for the TUE commission to make a, a, an informed decision eventually. And again, if unsure what level the athlete is, please contact uh, the, the, the person who will be following me in this webinar. So just in summary, who needs a TUE and when? So in advance versus retrospective, contact Drug Free Sport on their website. That's number one. There are application forms, there are new application forms, and I think some of them can be filled out online now too. So they are all available. Get the medical doctor, if you're an athlete, to fill out the form. If you are the medical doctor, assist your athlete to fill the form and produce uh, um, relevant evidence, and then that will be gone through soon, will be gone through soon by Lee, especially diagnostic and treatment evidence. Submit your application. Well, I wouldn't say at least 30 days. We know that they must be in place seven days in advance. But if you submit your application soon, it gives us an, enough time if we come back to ask for more information and, and the athlete can, can have time to find that. And then wait for the TUE to be granted before either competing or starting treatment. If the athlete's already on medication, well, then just get the TUE in as soon as possible. So remember, if you're not, if the medication, if not on the list and you do not have a TUE in place, the medication you're using, it will be a doping violation and sanctions can follow. Um, we've gone through this now. Who needs to apply? The national level athletes and international level athletes must apply in advance. Check the way, SAID's website for the criteria. And if you don't meet any of the criteria, you probably fall into the category of other athletes who apply mostly retroactively. One of the key things, and one of our Varsity Cup players were tested this year. Um, one of the key things I did tell him on the night, because he got very panicky when they called him for a doping test, and he's on the Ritalin. My, my, my information to him was, please, when you fill out the doping control form, do indicate on the form all medications that you're taking, including the banned substance, so that it doesn't look dodgy that you're that you're not you you're taking the stuff you test positive but you're not declaring it on the form so most retroactive TUEs are for acute conditions and emergency situations that happen uh, while competing for example anaphylactic reactions or, or or diabetics with problems or asthmatics with tight chests or whatever in terms of expiry dates of TUEs, acute TUEs are only valid for that particular occurrence of the, uh, of the event for which they have applied. For example, using acute medication for whatever, not for all future occurrences. And for chronic conditions though, um, we will approve TUEs as, as condition specific. So I think that's all I have to say for this, Lee. I'm sure there'll be questions later. Sounds a bit more confusing, but all this information is on the Drug Free Sport website. So I'm going to stop sharing now and thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for that. Um, now I'd like to introduce to our next speaker. Uh, often people don't get to see the face of uh, these administrators, and they actually have a lot of work and a lot of things to deal with. So I'm going to call upon Sakumji to give us a little bit more detail about what kind of interaction the athlete must expect with himself as a TUE uh, administrator. Sakumji. Um, good evening, everybody. Well, now that can everyone have, hear me? Uh, yes, I can, can hear you, Sakumzi. 
Okay. Um, um, we can't yet see your slides. Oh. Let me just start again. Okay. Now? Um, that's better if you make it. There we go. We can see your slides. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So for me, my role as the administrator, for most cases, I will be the first point of interaction with the, either the parents, the athlete, or the federation that's sending in the, the application. So I'm just going to take everyone through the process, how it normally occurs. So applications and advice for TUEs, I receive them mostly from athletes, parents, and other sporting bodies. It differs where, how the, 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 the mode of communication, but mostly by email. So um, I, I just wanted you to note something before I, I proceed. All the, the, the information and the interaction that I have, I always um, consult with the TUE, TUEC chairperson, Dr. Dr. Pillay. So whatever information I request from athletes or, or anyone that has sent in the, the application, the, 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 the requirements are not from myself, but from the TUE chairperson himself. So what I do is upon receiving the application, I check if all the, inf the required information <clears throat> is included in the form, Upon checking that, I also check that the, the substance that the, the applicant is applying for is listed on the, on the water prohibited list. As Dr. Pile mentioned, there are changes on a yearly basis to, to the water prohibited list. For those that require TUEs in advance, I have a system wherein I, 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 I keep those records. All those steps, including those that do not require TUEs, the confirmation comes um, straight from Dr. Pillay. If a TUE is not required, I will send the correspondence to the applying person or, or federation, notifying them of such. And that, that uh, response obviously comes from Dr. Pillay. The, the, the confirmation of, of, of oh, the, the request confirmation of, I request confirmation of received from the correspondence so that we can keep um, a paper trail of whether, whether the, the, the application was not needed or not. The filing system, I'm not gonna get um, into it. It's more of my, my own thing. Um, as, as mentioned before, if the substance is then um, does reflect on the water prohibited list, it's only then we're gonna proceed with the application. If all fields are complete and the required information is complete, I'll send the, 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 the entire file to Dr. Pillay just for a, a final check before the, the actual um, review by the, the rest of the TUE uh, members. It's also quite important to note that the supporting evidence needs to be completed in English or French so that myself, I can also have a browse through of what's in contained in the medication or all the required fields are, are, are filled in correctly. So now if it's another language, it's gonna be a, there's gonna be a problem. Um, if the supporting evidence is incomplete, I, I, I upon discussions with the Dr. Pile, you will send in the recommendations of what needs to be um, included for the for the file to be considered for a review by the the rest of the members. Um, the the timelines it's another important factor because in most cases athletes as soon as they send in the application they think that. Um, the time, the time frame for them to, to be accepted or denied is, is not set. But I do mention in the correspondence that it, it ranges from two days to 21 days. But also that depends on the, the case itself because each case is unique. But um, 
for from from my experience, we've never actually had cases whereby twenty one days pass without a, a decision being rendered. So, in most cases, it's two to to five working days. Um, there is a schedule for each um, TUE that goes in to to say it, but also. On the schedule, the identity numbers are only assigned to TUEs that are that go to to, re, to the review by the rest of the TUE members. If upon consultation with Dr. Pile, we notice that um, a, a, a TUE is not going to be required for that specific athlete, then the the, the that that TUE will not be allocated uh, an, an identity number. Um, in terms of record keeping, um, we do uh, we use the anti doping administration and management system, shortly named ADAMS. It is a, a, a WADA system that keeps track of all the anti doping information for, for, for athletes. So upon rejection or approval of a TUE, we keep all the that information so that it's accessible to WADA and other anti-doping agencies. Uh, this is basically what I just mentioned in the previous slides in terms of record keeping from uh, from the state side um, and and WADA especially with the Adam system. Uh, Um, when the application is, is successful, I do send communication to notify the athlete or the applying body of the, the acceptance of the TUE. And also, you will find on the accepted TUE, there will be an expiry date. But from last year, we started uh, an, an initiative wherein we send reminders to the accepted parties two months prior to the expiry, just to remind them that they need to reapply for the TUE. That doesn't only apply to the accepted ones, the denied ones as well. We do send communication to them to notify them that the TUE was denied and for what particular reasons was denied. And that information obviously is compiled by Dr. Pelia and the, and the rest of the TUE committee members. So we send them that communication and that communication speaks to them in, in terms of if they do want to appeal the decision, all that information is there in that, in that formal letter. With regards to retroactive applications, as Dr. Thompson mentioned earlier, those are the ones that are slightly more complicated because at times they're gonna, require the doping control department, myself and my manager to liaise with the legal department um, and just get um, their, their, their perspective on how are we gonna tackle that, that specific case. Um, the schedule is updated on a regular basis, um, especially with, with regards to the, the retroactive um, applications. Um, this part, I just wanted to, to share this screen. This is the, the anti-doping and management system. This is basically the page that I would get when I am entering a, 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 a denied or even an accepted TOE into the Adam system for, for record keeping. I wanted to share this screen so that I can just put emphasis to to the fact that when an application is sent through to say we need all the fields to be filled in because if there's any if there's any information that is missing in that in that form we are unable to enter this the system doesn't allow us to save anything without filling in all these these specific fields and also the the, the information from the doctor side we need all this information 
as as Dr. Pillay has said that we, we did sign the, the confidentiality agreement. So all this information will be kept confidential and only states and, and WADA will have access to it. So just on that on that on that note, we, we, we do uh, um, appreciate a form that's filled in properly. And also that helps on our side to to call to um to quickly expedite the process. These are the all the other the other fields that are needed for for us to enter the the, the TOE in Adams. But mainly all of them are found in the form. So if there's anything that is unclear, you can obviously contact says, then we'll try and explain to you in detail as to what needs to be filled in where. Um, from my side, um, I think that's it. If there's anything else, you can just send through your questions at the later stage. Dr. Pillay. Thank, thank you, Sakumzi. Um, so I'm sure everybody can appreciate uh, since we started these talks, there's, there's, there's a massive amount of work that goes into this year. And uh, Sakumzi, unfortunately, has the bulk of it all. Um, and he's one person doing this year. So please have patience with him when, when applications are put through. Uh, but we do, we do always try and expedite everything, uh, all um, applications all the time. Um, Sakumzi, can I just share my screen there, please? Can you stop sharing your screen? Right. Right, screen's up now. So what I'm going to chat to, to you all about now is regarding the information that we require as the TUE committee in order to make these decisions. When we're reviewing the, uh, all this information, it help, makes life much easier with, with, with us having as much information as we can. And sometimes you will see that we will request further information. Sometimes the athletes and the doctor are well enough to give us all the information that we require. Now, very importantly, there's this very, very long document called the International Standards Therapeutic Use Exemption. It's a 23 page document, but the guidelines of how to use this document is 111 pages. From this document, the most important aspects of this is Article 4.2. So every anti-doping TUE committee around the world uses this as their baseline when they're deciding on uh, whether TUE must be approved or not. So an athlete may be granted, he may be granted this, uh, he may be granted a TUE if, and only, only if, uh, sorry, and, and only if the athlete can show by a balance of probability that each of the following conditions are met, okay? So, 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 so that, that also is, is very important because they all need to, be, need to be met in order for a decision to be made. So if we go through these points, there's four important points. Point number one, the prohibited substance or prohibited method in question must treat an acute or chronic medical condition such that the athlete would experience significant impairment to health if the prohibited substance or method were withheld. So this is important to understand because we're talking about using medication in emergency settings, uh, as um, Dr. Thompson mentioned in anaphylactic shock, where you might need adrenaline, cortisone, et cetera, uh, and IV excess. Uh, so, so it's important that, that the medication does not uh, uh, negatively affect the patient and the patient does require it in order to function normally. Then the use of that substance is highly unlikely to produce some kind of a athletic performance uh, in that athlete, whether an, an acute or chronic medication. So that also is an important point because some, some medications do cause uh, and, and, and help people improve their athleticism. 
depending on strength, power, speed, etc. While others are just plain simply illegal to use. And that's why they fall in the banned substance list. Then, if there's no therapeutic alternative medication or method that is available in any of the scientific literature. So we're looking at how things are done within the normal world of medicine and whether in any country that you go to, this decision will be made in that perspective, knowing that there is no other medication that can be used to treat that specific medical condition. Then the last part and the last thing that needs to be answered is that the use of this prohibited substance is not because of a use of another prohibited substance previously where TUE was not held. So that sounds a little bit confusing, but what it basically means is that if they had doping issues and were using medication or anything whatsoever, and they had no TUE in place, and now they have a medical related condition where they require a medication that's on the WADA prohibited list, then they will not fulfill this criteria 4.2.4. So, so, so it's important to realize that every single review that we go through, we, we make sure that each application meets with all four of these points. If it meets, if it doesn't meet with any with, with all four, there's a problem. And then we, we definitely need to move on and either ask for more information or do um, or deny the uh, TUE. So this whole process of what we require is, is simply, simply that the application must be completed by the athlete or the guardian. And there's a certain section that the doctor must complete, not the athlete, but the doctor that's submitting the TUE. So that's quite important as well, because he needs to sign it and say that he's uh, taken uh, cognizance of this. So if there were previous TUEs that you had approved, that the athlete had approved, please provide the evidence of that. So there is a section in the forms we it asks you for if you had previous TUEs and what that uh, approval number was. So that's quite important, okay? When we talk about all necessary medical information, we need every single document that has allowed you to make this definitive diagnosis and justify this medication that they need to, uh, need to, need to be taking. So for instance, uh, someone that requires a uh, methylphenidate, we want, to, we want to establish from psychologist reports, psychiatrist reports, school reports, and some of the rating scales like Connors, et cetera. And we need those that, that documentation to say, right, the process was followed in the way any international country would follow in making a diagnosis of this medical condition. Now, very, 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 uh, like, like, like we're doing this whole talk about uh, everyone getting to know the process. It's because all this information is actually available on sales, but no one actually bothers to even look for that. Another important part that people do not look for is information on the physician's guidelines. This is important because it's on the WADA's list where it helps the physician determine whether his athlete will meet the criteria for having a TUE granted depending on the medical information that he supplies. So it's important to go through those documents because they have everything from hormones to uh, glucocorticosteroids, et cetera. So have a look at that, have a look at the checklists, et cetera. So things don't have to go up and down all the time and you don't have to be frustrated and your athlete doesn't have to be frustrated during the application process. So these are very, very important. And please, please take down this website and please go there and try it out, okay? So it's important to note that the medical doctors that complete the forms or that provide any kind of evidence uh, supporting the diagnosis, they may be contacted by myself as the chair. And, and the reason for this is maybe we want to seek more clarity on some issues that were brought up, or, 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 or maybe we just want to confirm things because uh, thing, uh, things were not written down properly on those forms. Sometimes people get to miss things because they're quite busy. So, so that will happen either telephonically, but we prefer on an email basis because then we have a paper trail of the communication that has happened. So as you can see, it's, there's a lot of information that's required for this process. Uh, and, 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 and it will be appreciated if we get as much information. The less information we have, 
the, the more likely that the TUE is either going to be denied completely or denied requesting further information. Uh, and that just delays the entire process unnecessarily. So with that, I think I'd like to bring you to our final speaker, Dr. Kirby, who's going to speak to us about another important thing, the changes in this WADA list. So, so these changes become very, very vital. And the reason why these changes become vital because sometimes drugs can be taken off, drugs can be put on, and sometimes dosages can change. So I would like to hand you over to Dr. Kirby. Lee, do you mind um, enlarging to a slideshow format? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm on load shedding, so I'm by candlelight, so I'm going to be leaving my video off. Um, thank you to um, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Pillay for the information provided so far. Um, so uh, please advance to the next slide. Um, every year, um, there's changes made to the water prohibited list. Um, and SAIDS takes the time to look through that list and then updates our own medication checks that it fits in with it. Um, the changes usually are available from about October or November. Um, but SAIDS does their best to distribute the information as soon as possible. Um, there's usually a summary document that's also dispersed at that time. Um, so what I'm gonna go through now is what are the changes for 2022, which are the most important ones. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. So, the biggest change for 2022 is to do with um, beta agonists. Um, all selective and non-selective beta-2 agonists, including all optical isomers, are prohibited except for inhaled salbutamol, which has now got a maximum of 1,600 micrograms over 24 hours in divided doses, which cannot exceed 600 micrograms over eight hours starting from any dose. So th this is quite a specific amount. Um, and one needs to take note that if somebody's nebulized, they can easily exceed this. Um, inhaled for motorol, the maximum dose is 54 micrograms over 24 hours. Cell is 200 micrograms over 24 hours. Philanterol, which I don't think is available in South Africa, is 25 micrograms over 24 hours. So any athlete that's needing a higher dose of this needs a TUE in place. Um, Keep in mind also that the, the reasoning behind this is to prevent people from using oral salbutamol, for instance, um, because with standard prescribed dosages where one would be using cortisone instead of as a preventer, instead of just using a rescue, you shouldn't be exceeding these doses. Then we've got a weird and wonderful new drug that's been prohibited. It's called BPC-157. It's an experimental drug. It's not yet FDA approved. Um, so far, I've only seen studies done on rats on it. Fascinating molecule though. It is a um, peptide hormone um, from the stomach, gastric peptide hormone. Um, they're doing studies on it for inflammatory bowel disease and soft tissue healing, um, but it's showing good signs of helping with tendon and muscle healing, all sorts of things like that. But at this stage, it hasn't been tested in humans. It's not been approved as a medication as such. So athletes can't go around experimenting with it. So it is banned. Um, adrenaline or epinephrine, as it's known in other countries, from 2022, it is permitted for an athlete to carry an EpiPen without a prior application. That's carry it. If they actually use it, then they need to do a um, retrograde application. So if your athletes are allergic to bee stings or something like that, they can now keep the EpiPen without having to pre-apply. Glucocortisones is the big also other change. So in, in past years, um, oral and rectal and intramuscular was banned, but you were allowed it in um, intraarticular roots. But from 2022, it is no longer allowed. So currently only intranasal, dermal or topical in, and inhaled preparations are still allowed, so for asthma. 
but all other routes for administration, intraarticular, intramuscular, as well as the previous ones, are prohibited in competition only. Which means that one's got to ask a couple of questions when you're going to be giving a glucocorticoid to your patient. Firstly, is, is the patient in competition or not? Competition is defined as starting from midnight before the event until midnight after the event. However, if it is a series of games, it is the entire period from the start, the first, the last events, e.g. the season. So the whole Vasti Cup season or the whole Curry Cup season, not just match days. And the TUE is required for use any time during that time. Next question is, has this treatment been administered out of competition, but within the washout period? Now, this is an, a new concept with regards to cortisones. Um, the washout period has been determined by pharmacokinetic studies as the time from administration to the time that levels are likely to be undetectable in the blood or urine. So that means we've start, got to start identifying specific substances and how long they need to be out of your system before you can actually use them so that you don't land up in a washout period. Um, the next slide, I'm going to go into more detail of this. And has this treatment been administered out of competition, but outside of the washout period, in which case a TUE is not required, but still keep your medical records as though you were going to apply for a TUE just in case something goes wrong. Next slide, please. So this is now going to be the uh, washout table. So they did pharmacokinetic studies and there we go, almost there. Yeah. Um, the washout period was also determined by the method of administration. Okay, so all glucocorticoids except triamcinolone um, is a washout period of three days. Triamcinolone has a washout period of 30 days. Um, and it's interesting to know that triamcinolone was previously at the Olympics, one of the essential drugs that had to be kept. Um, in South Africa, you have to apply for a special exemption to get to, get to use it in South Africa to import it because it's not available in general. Um, but if you've got visiting international athletes, they might be using it, for instance. Intramuscularly, betamethasone, dexamethasone, and methylprednisolone washout period is five days, whereas prednisone and prednisone is 10 days, and then triamcinolone is 60 days. So in general, if you work with an athlete, not that brilliant idea to be dealing with triamcinolone. Local injections, including periarticular, intraarticular, peritendinous, and intratendinous, all glucocorticoids is three days, except the triamcinolone, prednisone, and prednisone, which is 10 days. So I think it's quite important to keep this a copy of this table somewhere. Um, and when one's considering using a cortisone uh, for a bursitis that's not responding to NSAIDs or something like that, that one has a quick squiz at this and just checks how long the things are going to be out of the washout period um, in terms of your athlete and do you need to apply for a TUE in case they're going to be in that washout period time. So I hope that's clear and that's um, it's quite an important change um, from this year. The last thing which I don't think we've got on a slide um, you may remember that there is medicines and there's methods. Um, so the change in method in water code M2.2 is the area of the blood manipulation, chemical and physical manipulation. It's important to note that the volume of intravenous infusions given to athletes is limited. Intravenous infusions and or injections of more than a total of 100 mils per 12 hour period except for those legitimately received in the course of hospital treatments, surgical procedures, or clinical diagnostic investigations is banned. So you can no longer rehydrate an athlete with IVs um, because your limit is 100 mils. They have to be rehydrated orally. Um, and if this volume is exceeded, um, then uh, TUE will be needed. And things like giving athletes vitamin bombs or all such weird and wonderful things. Um, also, your limitation would be 100 mils. 
I hope that that is clear. When in doubt, the online medication check is really useful. Um, just keep in mind it's using South African names of medications. So if you put in an American name of medicine, it's not going to show up. Um, and you can search by trade name. Um, sometimes the generics are listed, but it's actually more by trade name. Um, and it's very useful. You can also have it on your phone encourage athletes to have it on their phones as well so that they can um, understand it and, and encourage them to understand the color coding system in it as well. Uh, the band at all times versus the band in competition only versus the band in certain sports. Um, and then there's also a group that are banned only in either females or only in males. And that is my story. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirby. I think uh, everyone had a nice listen to this last bit of our talk. Uh, we hope that we've, we've, we've allowed and we've, we've given everyone a little bit more clarity as to how the process works, uh, what is important um, to actually supply, what information is important to supply, and how we actually go about making these decisions. It's a, it's a rigorous process and it's not something that we take lightly uh, because we are affecting people's lives. So. Please, if you have any questions and you're unsure, always just ask, ask SAIDS. Uh, I think now we can open up the floor for any uh, questions. Uh, yes, Lee, um, there are a few questions that have come through and I, I see, thank you, you've, you've kindly answered a couple of them already, um, but I think it's worth um, asking this question again because a couple of people have it. Um, so the understanding is that uh, national athletes need uh, prospective TUA, TUE um, exemption, yet um, anything lower than a national athlete only needs retrospective. Is that correct? Yes, that understanding is correct. As Dr. Thompson said, uh, Dr. Thompson, maybe you can uh, elaborate on this here because you did have a lot of this on your slides. Yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. So national, um, as I said, um, athletes that are, are are classified as national by their federations and and or international definitely all need TUEs in advance, and other um, you know who, who, who don't uh, fall into this categories. And sometimes it can be a bit of a gray area, but other athletes generally are not. Um, are not registered with their federations under the registered testing pool. And they would only put the registered testing pool athletes on the Adam system generally, because um, that's required for the international uh, use and for WADA to have access to it. Um, so that's, that's, that's generally how it, it is addressed. So that you don't really, in, and in terms of other, if everybody was on Ritalin, we'd be getting thousands of TUE um, applications on a regular basis. So generally how, how we manage it is that, oh, if you're an other athlete, have your information available. Um, and if you are tested and your test comes up positive, then that, that needs to be um, submitted to the TUE commission for, for evaluation. So it's not so, oh, all other athletes must keep their information available for just in case they get tested. But as you can well understand, many other athletes are use medication, but they're not tested. Thanks, Dr. Thompson. Um, Johan van Yerden asked a very similar question. So Johan, I'm, I'm, I hope you've uh, listened to that uh, answer from Dr. Thompson, because it answers your, your, your second question here. I see your first question is saying that uh, it seems that the Adams does not have a category for other athletes. So, Sakumzi, perhaps you can come on board to uh, uh, explain this in a little bit more detail, how it works for the other athletes. Um, the, the, the Adams system does have a, an option for other athletes. It's international, national, and other athletes. But most times when we do for other athletes, we have to create a profile first because most of them haven't been tested before or they only got just got tested when they, they, they needed to apply. But there is an option for other athletes just for record keeping purposes. Great, thank you for that. Um, 
Lee, if, if I could ask a question, just um, I think we've covered it, but just as a means of uh, perhaps re reiterating the process, um, I'm going to pretend for a moment that I'm a, a good athlete and I have just uh, run a marathon and I've finished in the top 10 and somehow um, I've managed to um, be called up for testing. I'm not a national athlete, I'm just a club athlete. And can someone um, talk me through what's going to be happening through that whole process? It's the first time this has ever happened to me. I'm quite nervous. Um, I've just been, uh, I was excited for my run, but I've just been pulled aside and now I need to go for um, dope testing. So can, can as, as the group perhaps explain to me what will happen during that process? Okay, initially, uh, what happens is this, this, this involves more about the doping control process. Okay. So, so um, upon, upon being identified as an athlete that needs to be uh, tested, you will have a doping control officer that will accompany you to a specific room where there are closed bottles of fluids, more especially water, et cetera. There's some documentation to complete, and you can take a representative uh, with you as well. Uh, it's important because at least you know that uh, you covered all bases and if something happens unusually with samples, etc., you've had uh, a witness with you as well. So, so I think that doping control process always goes through the same. Uh, the same uh, it's about waiting for a good enough urine sample, at least 90 mils, which is split in two as well uh, and not uh, concentrated or not uh, too diluted as well. Uh, it needs to have a, a very good specific gravity. And uh, that gets used for the tests, for the doping control tests. So for instance, if the athlete tests negative, fantastic, tests negative, there's no adverse analytical finding. Mm -hmm. If there is an adverse analytical finding, uh, let's say for instance, if this, was, if this is just a recreational athlete, and uh, let's say he has, uh, they found glucocorticosteroids uh, positive on his uh, testing then this athlete will be allowed to justify that by applying for retroactive TUE. Okay. So for instance, may, he perhaps has a medical condition. Maybe he's got alternative colitis or something or ankylosing spondylitis, which requires him to use medication like this here in order to control his condition. Then he, he can just collect and gather all that medical information, send it through with his application for a review. Uh, and that's usually how the process would work. All right. So, as the athlete myself, at that moment when I'm when I'm in the in the the testing station, I should be just writing down absolutely everything that I take, so that if there's any analytical finding that does come through, it's it's like uh, Dr. Thompson said, it's not like I'm trying to hide anything. Yes, correct. Uh, whether it's a smarty whether it is an, an, an unusual energy bar that you've had uh, uh, from, from, from certain uh, product makers, et cetera. I think it's important to put these things down because you never know where the next positive test or next uh, um, uh, contaminated sample of, uh, uh, of food, et cetera, may be coming from that is something that uh, uh, will give it an adverse analytical finding. Okay, thank you. Um, we've, we've mentioned quite a bit about resources that are available, and I think the one that comes up um, a lot is, is the, the drugfreesport.org.za website. Um, so I think it's a good idea. I have written it in the chat, and I think it's a good idea for everyone to go and check it out. Um, but to now take, take the discussion from a different point of view um, with putting on my doctor hat. So I'm a pediatrician, and I've just seen a... Um, a young athlete who has developed asthma, or I'm now diagnosing with asthma, and I would like to put on some medications. Myself as the doctor, the best way to go about it is it to go and look straight at that drug-free sport website. Dr. Kirby or Dr. Thompson, do you want to uh, handle this uh, question? So okay. I'm about to I'm 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 about to prescribe some um, beta two agonists, and um, I just want to make sure for my athletes this is a this is a national level swimmer, and I just want to make sure that this person isn't going to run into any trouble. Um, so what would you advise? The best thing to go and look at a 
a website, um, Drug Free Sports. Maybe I go look at wider website. Um, the best um, this starting place definitely is going to be to go to the SAIDS website, the SAIDS medication check. And if, if you just type in your web browser, S-A-I-D-S medication check, it'll actually take you to the right page immediately. Um, and then you type in the name of your medication and then you will know whether it is banned or not. And if it is banned, if there's something like a dosage limitation, it actually shows you on that page what that dosage limitation is. Okay. We do need to keep in mind that treating our patients is our prior priority. If it's an emergency, you always treat your patients first and you sort out the doping stuff afterwards. Okay. Great. Um, thank you for that. Um, as, uh, as a general question, I see that there, there's someone asking as a, a student journalist at WITS, um, what type of impact does this have on the, the, the sporting community? I think the question really is, is how many people do you have um, applying to the TUE committee? Um, is, this, is this a very common thing that, that uh, lots of people are on abnormal medications and are getting tested often? Or is it, is it more something that international athletes um, or, or people caring for international athletes should be concerned about? Um, yes, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question this year. And it's important to understand that we, we on average during the quiet times, we'll probably get one application every week or 10 days. Um, during busy times, especially now with Commonwealth Games coming up, we're starting to see a few more applications coming in sooner, thick and fast. And especially the last two years, it's been a bit quiet because of COVID. So there haven't been competitions and haven't been testing, etc. But now that things nationally and internationally are going back to relative normality with sports, uh, the processes are all starting again. So we're starting to see at least about three or four weeks. So we do have quite a, quite a large number of uh, applications coming through. Great, thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, and it seems like there aren't. Um, Can I just, might be, yes. Sorry, sorry, Robin, there was a question earlier about an under 20 uh, uh, player in rugby yes. um, playing for a provincial team and how they would how they would be classified so just again as i've said earlier on the on the web on the drug free sport website there there's again a, a table of all sports and what the federations the national federations and the international federations consider to be national athletes or not so for example that particular player in rugby is only playing for his province and the member said saru uh, at the moment and obviously these things can change from time to time saru classifies only the curry cup and 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 the the probably the urc championship at the moment the united rugby championship as national competitions so playing in those teams would classify you as a national athlete and hence you need to have advanced tues in place anything below that so example under 20s under you know they, they used to have under 19 and under 20 they now just have under 20s and for example even for now um the the uh, varsity cup they would fall under other competitions because they, they do test during the varsity cup and they will also test uh, um, sometimes during uh, under 20s and also remember in rugby to never forget the sevens so sevens would fall under the same uh, same criteria but that's usually set by the federations um, so, and it's federation specific. So whatever sport you are involved with, you have to check with your own federation, what classifies as a national athlete and what classifies as a, um, a, a, an international athlete and don't take anything for granted, rather just double check. Um, because sometimes the information's old and outdated that we get on, you know, that's maybe not updated frequently on SAIDs, but your federation will definitely know um, what classification of athlete you are. So don't take chances. Thank you. Um, Craig, while we have you there, um, another question. Would the National Rugby Youth Week, something like Craven Week, be considered a national um, level competition? No, no, no. It's, it's, as I said, it's very specific on the, drug free, on, on the, on the rugby website that it is only, um, only the Curry Cup competition and the uh, national, you know, like we was Super 15 before, yes. 
um, th those competitions. But it doesn't mean that you are exempted at the Craven Week because we do a lot of testing at Craven Week. So the others come into play at a competition, for example, like Craven Week. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. May... Yes, please go ahead. Dr. Kirby. Um, oh, I disappeared again. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very important for us as sports physicians to educate our patients. So when we have especially school athletes, youth athletes, or low level athletes that aren't going to be in a doping pool as of yet, but potentially down the line, maybe, or maybe in a competition where there's doping testing, and you see that they're on a banned substance to, to question them about the banned substance and, and find out on the basis of what? Uh, I've seen an incredible amount of students who are on Ritalin who don't meet criteria for TUE by any means. They only take it for exams or things like that, which means they don't actually meet the diagnostic criteria on a DSM-4, for instance. Um, so just be proactive in being aware of what are the banned substances and educating our patients. Because a lot of them, when they hear that, then they're like, okay, then I won't take it anymore. Then you think, well, did you really need it in the first place? So yeah. <laughs> Good point. All right. Well, if there are no further questions and no further comments from the panel, um, then I'd, I'd very much like to thank uh, all of the, the panelists um, for joining us. Thank you very much for putting together those presentations. Um, there weren't many questions. That means that you obviously answered everyone's questions. Um, so thank you very much um, to all of you for giving of your time this evening. Okay. Thanks. And thanks for arranging, Robin. And, Good and luck, everyone. For, yeah, and thank you for everyone attending uh, and uh, trying to uh, understand this process of TUEs. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to everyone. Um, like Leah said, thank you very much for attending. Uh, we'd like to, as always, thank our sponsors, Asina Lita, um, for helping us uh, put these together. Also, thank you to SASMA um, for advertising amongst your members and also assisting us um, with putting these things together. Um, I see Prof. Um, Krista Janssel van Rensburg was with us this evening, so thank you very much to her and all the, the rest of the SASMA members. Um, we will be having more of these uh, webinars in the coming months. Um, the one that's coming soonest is on Wednesday, the 1st of June, um, and that is arranged in collaboration with the Johannesburg Orthopedic Sports Institute and the um, Center for Sports Medicine and Orthopedics. And it's going to be an evening about stem cells. Um, and just please take note that those start at 6.30. Um, the last thing that I must mention is that CPDs is now uh, more of an automated process. Uh, what happens is that um, the attendee list for this webinar, we send through to the HBCSA and they will then accredit um, your accounts should you be needing CPD points. So that means that filling in your details when you register for um, these webinars becomes more and more important. Um, once uh, you leave, uh, you'll be sent to a feedback form. Uh, we do value your feedback and we would like to improve going forward. So once again, thank you very much everyone for joining us and I hope you have a good evening. <laughs>